Thank you for everyone for coming to the Greenhouse series. And um, today I'm just going to be I'm going to be talking about how I use Dentron. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Kevin. I was the original founder at Dentron, and I created it because I needed a better way to organize tens of thousands of Markdown notes um, and stay sane while doing it. Uh, the format for today is I'm going to share my screen and I'm just going to show you uh, my workflow. So let's do that. Also, Tyler, welcome. Uh, we are just getting started. So um, as I was saying, I'm going to do a screen share and then I'm going to go over uh, where I go over what I do for the day. So this is my main dungeon workspace. You can see that we have a lot of windows open. Uh, my typical setup, I like the six pane split um, on a big monitor. And the way that I use it, um, every window is divided into a function. So this, you can think of this as window number one. I use this for my daily journal. So this is everything I'm gonna be doing today. This is my things for the week. Uh, this is kind of tracking uh, team priorities. And this is my personal backlog. But window one is actions, things I'm going to do. Um, and then we get to, well, and then we get to window two. And so window two is for ad hoc things uh, or specifically meetings. So I have two journal notes that I keep for meetings and comments. One is this Meta journal, which is everything that I am uh, discussing or meeting or talking to people today. So as you see here, this was my community announcement in Discord. I usually like to type everything up in Dendron before I announce it, just so that it's indexable and I have a copy of it. And it, I find it easier to um, edit inside of Vim and Markdown. Um, the other one, so this is a convention that we established here at Dendron, is a lot of the times if we need to comment on something, we have a comment journal. And so this comments um, is something that people can refer to um, in terms of like, hey, like this is what Kevin said about this, or this is what Kuran said about that. Um, you can think about, we've, we at Dendron at least, we found it really useful to track um, longer conversations and to be able to reference past conversations. So think of this as like our version of Slack that's actually, uh, that we can actually find later on. Um, so, wind so window one is actions, window two is meetings and events that come up. Window three, I use this as projects. And so this is anything I am currently working on. For example, right now you'll see this is gonna be the greenhouse talk. And this is kind of uh, set up in a queue. So anything that, as things uh, come up in urgency, they get put at the end of the queue. And then as I do things, um, these tabs get unpinned and then I will get rid of them. Um, speaking of pins, so Kiran really wants me to mention this, but you'll notice that for a bunch of, uh, for all these windows, there are some tabs that I have pinned and so these uh, pins are kind of my anchors in my workspace. So I always have my daily journal pin so that it's easy for me to get to. But then also at the end of the day, when I want to make my journal for the next day, I have a sharding point. Uh, same thing with the meetings. Um, and so you'll notice the pattern of you know, pins. Um, OK, so this is Windows 3. I use this for whatever I'm currently working on. It's nice that it's in the center of the six pane layout because it's easy for me using them to go to other windows uh, from here. And then down here in window four, um, this is documentation or things that I uh, look at often. So the package hierarchy is the various code that is in Dendron. So the Dendron API, the Dendron web app, um, the projects are all the projects that we're currently taking on. So these are the projects for July. 
And then this is the change log, which uh, usually we keep, I keep updated uh, as features get pulled in. So, um, and this is also, so I will use this window when I need to look up documentation for something. Like maybe I want to edit the, or developer setup, or I want to look up um, how or publishing works. This is the window that I have to do it. Um, and then Windows 5 and 6, um, these are really scratch buffers. So for example, if I'm working on a project and I need more context, I will go to Windows 5 and 6 to do whatever it is that I need. Um, some additional things about the setup, you'll notice that Control Shift M for me maximizes the current window. So it's a setting by default, it doesn't have a keyboard shortcut, but I find it's really useful if I need to zoom in on something versus take everything into perspective. Um, and then other things to note about keyboard shortcuts, I have a keyboard shortcut for every single window. So control one, two, three, four, five, six, go between the various windows. And then within each window, uh, command one, two, three, four, go between the various tabs. Um, my philosophy for this is you can definitely go overboard, but for me, it's anything um, that I want to do, or like if it's, it, it should be navigatable within like two keystrokes for common actions. Um, most of these keyboard shortcuts, they don't have a default binding. And so after this talk, I'll also publish uh, my key bindings for anyone that wants to do something similar. Um, so I think I, that covers basically the layout. And next, I'm going to talk about kind of my process of how I chart the day. Uh, something also to note is that if at any point people have questions, um, feel free to raise a hand or type it into the chat um, or just say something. And uh, we'll have time for that as well. All right. So uh, the daily journal is typically where I live in, um, and it consists of things I want to do for the day in priority order. And the way that daily journals get created is the night before, I will create the next daily journal, and uh, I have a stand-up template. So stand-up Kevin that, kind, that fills out um, my standard like daily journal format. Um, the things to note here is, so I keep track of my tasks in the front matter just in terms of like numbers. So what I track is number of tasks I'm taking on at the beginning of the day, as well as number of tasks that uh, come up. Um, I'm doing this just because I find that usually I don't get through all my tasks. And so this is just a good way for me to track over time Am I getting through everything I set out to do, or do I need to rebalance my load somewhere? Um, right now, this is kind of just um, something that isn't really graphed, but um, it's pretty easy to, for example, create a script to uh, extract the front matter. And in the future, we also have plans of supporting visualizations based off metrics that you put here. OK. So going back, um, something else that I'll do is, so uh, VS Code has a setting that lets you put up a tab in preview. That means if you don't edit it, like the tab that you just opened will disappear. I don't do that because uh, I like having this context, but I also have a shortcut to close all the tabs to the right if I need to close everything. Um, generally, the way that I work is if it's pinned, then that's something I want to keep. But if it's not pinned, then I can close it at any time. Um, now, something else that you'll notice if I go to my previous journal, um, one thing to notice, so Dendron has this, uh, uh, the ability to navigate between journals. It's called sibling navigation. Um, it's really useful if you have a journal that you want to go through, such as this. Um, Kiran, you have your hand raised. Yeah. Uh, so do you just have one journal for both work and personal stuff? Um, like one of the key value props is like, 
I should be able to separate this thing, this out, right? So yep. how do you handle that? Like, so personally? yeah, great question. So the way that I handle that is I keep separate workspaces. So this is my work workspace. Um, and I keep all attention related work in here. So, uh, and then I also have a different workspace. Uh, this is for my personal stuff. And I have a daily journal in my personal. Uh, this is my daily journal for today. I haven't oh, okay. filled it out yet. Um, I find it, while it's possible for me to keep both of them in my dungeon, like work workspace, yeah. um, I'm always paranoid about accidentally committing my personal journal into my work journal, which is why I keep separate workspaces. Um, but one thing that is interesting is, for example, if you look at my personal journal, so here are all the vaults that are in the personal journal, uh, or sorry, in my personal workspace. I have something I call the people vault. And essentially the people vault is my personal directory of every person that I've ever uh, had any interactions with. I find that it's pretty useful to have this in multiple contexts. So if you look at my Dungeon work workspace, I also have the people vault. And so, um, if you think about this as like, uh, in terms of reuse, um, I essentially, instead of keeping separate like people hierarchies, um, I reuse that vault in multiple places. But this is just something that I keep locally. I see. And you just always have that VS Code instance open and you kind of time splice between them. Like sometimes you're working on personal stuff and you get the red highlight and then sometimes you're working on work stuff um, yeah, you get the green one. Okay. And cool. for the highlight, I use um, an extension called Peacock. Um, so Peacock is really useful in, in terms of changing a color theme. So you can uh, oh, cool. change your favorite color. Um, I find that otherwise, VS Code is pretty nondescript, so it's kind of hard to tell where you're at. So the highlighting helps a lot. And then it saves that to the workspace settings? Yes, it saves it to the workspace. So that is the one thing you have to be careful of when you do this and you're doing this in a shared environment because um, people will inherit this if they pull down your workspace. Okay, uh, anything else? I am gonna keep going then. Um, so where are we? We were talking about journals. So you can use sibling navigation to go between days. And one thing you'll note is in my yesterday's journal, I have a bunch of symbols next to my tasks. So the way I do tasks is by bullet journal, where either the task I'm doing is done for the day or it is, it is carried over to the next day. Um, that is the normal bullet journal method. I, can, um, I have my own elaboration of this. And so if this is actually published in our handbook. So if you look at this, we actually um, explain the status symbols that we use. But essentially, we have a few more like D means we're not doing it. The dot means there's some progress made. It's depending deployment. But that's what the symbols mean. And my end of the day routine is to add symbols to all my tasks. And the idea is that if it is in my daily journal, I should have finished it or made some progress on it. Like you can notice that like for all my mid-level tasks, I made no progress on any of it, which is telling me that like I might as well kill my mid-level section because if you look at all my journals, I never make any, well, I rarely make progress on my mid-level tasks. Um, and that's just good for me to know so that I can take some action on that, which eventually I will. All right. Um, so another thing that you notice for the daily journal is that most of these links, they're not just links, they are, or most of the items I have in my to-do, so not just uh, bullet items, but they're links to different notes. So these are all scratch notes. Um, and the reason for this is usually the bullet item that I'm taking on requires more context. Um, the way to, so just as a refresher, um, to create a scratch note with a link, you can have a bullet, and then if you highlight it, um, you can do Command Shift S to make it into a scratch note. I actually have a keyboard shortcut 
um, because you can customize this command to create a scratch note without any prompt. So what it just does is it saves that one extra step. It just creates the title based on what you highlighted. In this case, I actually highlighted the uh, uh, dash, which I usually don't. But this is just a little quicker way of creating a scratch note. Um, and the reason I create a scratch note for my tasks, let me just delete this before I forget. Um, the reason I create a scratch note for my task is one, it lets me expand upon it. So this is a task right now to uh, work on the new preview for Dendron. And as you can see, it has a lot of um, related tasks. Um, and so scratch note is useful to keep context on that. But something else that's useful is in the backlinks, I can see every single day when I've worked on this task. And because a lot of um, the way that things work is um, temporally, a lot of the tasks I do on any given day will be related to a task that I work on. This is also an easy way to uh, one, see how long I've been working on something, but also find things that might be related uh, to a given task. Um, and let's see, for this particular case, um, usually I like to link tasks to a bigger initiative. And so this task is linked to uh, one of four projects for the month, which is building out the Next.js based preview. Um, all right. And so typically the way I do my days is I go down this list in priority order. So right now we're doing the greenhouse talk. Um, Prep greenhouse talk is already done and currently the greenhouse talk is underway. Um, and usually what I would do is if I weren't giving this talk, I would be having um, a meeting uh, in the meeting uh, journal for the day. I would typically do something like greenhouse and I would just uh, keep notes on it. Um, you'll notice that Initially, I started off by keeping things in this note, but then the idea is like later on the day, I'll split these off into their own individual notes to keep this log clean. Okay, um, so that's my daily journal. Um, next for meetings. Um, I think we already covered essentially, so meetings is what I do when I meet with people. Um, I usually attach links to people's names on it so that um, in case something comes up or uh, if I want to use backlinks, I can see all the times when I have uh, worked with a particular person. Uh, let's take, so for example, for Khan, I can see like, hey, here's all the times that we've had interactions in the Dungeon workspace. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, I think that's all for meetings. Um, next, I'll go a little bit into some of the hierarchies that I use, at least in the context of Dendron. So uh, I covered this a little bit in the beginning, but all the Dendron, um, let me, so all Dendron code is in the package hierarchy. And so for example, uh, the plugin is under Dendron plugin. Uh, we have the engine, um, the CLI. So the idea is that if you want to look up the internals of any anything related to or code, you can find it under package. And then when you're underneath package, this is also, uh, well structured. So if you wanted to do anything QA, every package has the following. Um, so how to do tests, how to do development, FEQ for commonly asked questions, operational issues. Um, and the nice thing about this is that um, once you learn the hierarchy for one package, it's the same for all packages. Um, so package hierarchy is one of our main hierarchies. Another one is projects. And so projects are uh, things we're taking on that might take longer than a couple of days, uh, that becomes a project. Um, so if we go into any of these, so the vault registry, this one's a bit messy, but it's, um, the vault registry is actually what is the seed bank right now. It was originally called the vault registry. Um, when we start a project, we, they all use the same template. 
Um, so what is the goal? What is the context? What does success mean? Um, and how that will look like. Oh, another thing is the way you can navigate tabs is using, I have, I don't even remember what the command is, but I have it mapped to command T. You can navigate all your open tabs like this. So this is another easy way of uh, navigation. Um, but for example, if we wanted to create a new project, um, I'm just going to create it here. We have uh, templates for most of the most things that are repeated. So this is a project template. So you have goal, context, success. And then uh, the nice thing about this is that all of our projects have a similar structure. And if we decide to add anything, it's something that the entire team can reuse. Um, these are some like work hierarchies. I can also show you some of uh, the hierarchies I have in my personal workspace. So um, a lot of what I do, for example, I have a CLI hierarchy for CLI tools. Um, every Git command, probably uh, at some point, anything that I've looked up in Stack Overflow and I've used more than once, um, I've included in here. So this is you know any Git command that I've looked up. Or um, if you've done an onboarding with me, you've seen this example my programming language hierarchy. So this is like what is true and true or false for Python. This is what's true and false from Ruby. I just like, I have a language hierarchy for when I'm switching between languages. And then I also have a project hierarchy for any project that I've ever used, just with documentations, snippets, anything that I've found helpful at one point that if I come back to the project, it would be helpful again. Um, and so, that is um, some of the hierarchies. Any questions, Karan, you have your hand up. I think that was from before, but I do have a question about, like when I've used this tab works, when I pin tabs, mm -hmm. I have this weird tendency where like, then I'll be in the wrong group and then I search for the same note. And it, instead of going to the note that's in like group one, I get the note in group two. So now I have duplicate notes of the same thing. Do you have anything that you're like, are you just really disciplined about which group you're in when you're opening stuff? Like based on your um, ideas from earlier where you're like, you know, group one is all my daily journal stuff and, you know, is journals, group two is meetings and things like that. Or do you have some other way of um, keeping those solved? Yeah. So for pin tabs, I think of pin tabs as like, they're useful if not done in excess. So there's generally, um, the number of pin tabs I have is generally constant. Um, and it helps that you know every window has a purpose. So windows yeah. one, two, three, four, there's a definite thing that I do for all of them. Um, the only places that I actually add new pin tabs to is my focus window, which is window three. And so generally what happens, and I guess I didn't go into this is, for example, let's say that I'm working on the preview now. I like to keep window one clean. So like anything that's not pinned, I will move to one of the other windows. So because I'm working on preview V2, I will now move it to window three, and then I will pin it. Oh, and that's then, OK. I wanted to learn how to do that. But yeah, I'm assuming so, that's a key binding that you will publish later. Yes, it's a key binding. Um, and unfortunately, it's been so long since I've actually used the commands. I don't remember what any of the commands are, but yeah. um, it'll be published in the key binding. And then what happens is when I'm done with this task, I will unpin it and then get rid of it. Another key binding that is very helpful, generally the way that I work is I end up with a lot of tabs that get open because I don't use preview tabs. Um, I will go back to my earliest pin note and then I have a keyboard shortcut to get rid of all the tabs on the right. So that just cleans up a window after I'm done. Uh, that makes sense. So you're always like going back to um, every single group has the pin tabs that it started with. And then mm -hmm. generally you do that once you finish a task, like that's your routine. Exactly. Um, so usually during the day, you'll find me, I'm either in Windows 3, because it's like whatever I'm focused on right now, or I'm done with the thing on Windows 3, and I'm going back to Windows 1 to do some, to find what the next thing is. Oh, that's cool. Okay. 
Cool. Uh, Samuel. Uh, you might need to unmute yourself. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. I, 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 I try to implement this para approach for, and, and I have done like, like projects areas. And when I'm doing the project, I, I saw I'm doing the prefix, the, the, the hierarchy with pro. And so I have not a situation where I have like my own personal projects. And then also I use the pro hierarchy schema that you, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you provided. So I have this mix now of para projects, which are more private, which doesn't fit to the schema and then other projects. And do you have any idea? How do you solve that? Is this um, also something you, you accounted or? Yeah, um, so generally, so right now, like if you have like a, uh, we don't support like multiple schemas in the same workspace. So if you have two schemas for projects and like a single workspace, then one of them will win out. It's usually the one you, uh, I think the logic is the most like topmost fault in your dungeon.yaml. Um, I guess for me, I, I just consolidate. Like for me, like the projects is, basically what is, uh, wait, sorry, before I keep diving in, let me just make sure I understand your question. Do you mean to say that you have different like schemas for a para project versus like, say like a dungeon project? Yeah, um, no, no, I have, I have the project schema uh, mm -hmm. where I have like the schema that, 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 that you provided in the schema mm -hmm. library. Yep. And so I'm using this mostly for like any project I encounter. It's not my personal project, it's more like, projects I use, open source projects or whatever, um, software projects. And maybe there's already the error here. Um, and then I have my own projects, which are which are also used the same hierarchy structure, but I'm not following necessarily the, 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 the schema um, mm -hmm. structure. So I actually want to separate them, but they're all projects. So maybe I call one pro and the other one pro G, as so a pro G. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this just depends on what you want to do with that. Like yeah. if, so like if you think of those projects, like if those projects have like the same model, then they should follow the same schema. But yeah. if your personal projects are organized differently, then it makes sense for that to um, have a different organization. Then one thing, there's a lot of ways of solving this. For example, you could put your personal projects in your personal workspace and create your own like project schema there. So that you know you can define how it looks like, or you could decide maybe under a project you want like work projects versus personal projects, and you can organize those two differently. Um, it just it just depends on what works for you. Yeah. Can, can I yes. jump in with one thing, Kevin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think for Para though, your software project should be under resources, right? So you should have like a like one thing you could try is to have a resource dot projects and that will be a completely different schema and hierarchy and they won't be in misalignment because with para I, I do the same thing where i'm trying to have all my projects areas resources and then an archive and then i have the the archive command that ships with dendron helps move from a project to an archive uh, but i think like you said the we've called them software projects before. they're they're like projects that are in the wild those aren't really your projects those should be in resources in my opinion yeah yes that's, that, that's great yeah mm -hmm. yeah and uh thanks for jumping in there and yeah this is like if you look down here this is how we've separated here is software projects are packages and then projects that we're actually doing in the Paris style are projects yes does the project has a schema actually in the, in yes the... so the projects uh i mean you can uh so right right now we're still building them uh out but like faq graph logs learn concepts yeah um i don't know if we've uh some of this is in the schema library some of it's not uh, we're still in the process of syncing that yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, OK, so it looks like we're getting close to the end of time. So there's just one more thing I want to cover, um, which is finding things in Dendron. So like traditionally, 
there's a couple of ways you can find things. So the, the one that we lead people to first is lookup. So if you want to look at anything, um, you can use lookup and you can find it. And the cool thing is, uh, for example, like this Dendron FEQ, this is part of Red Engine site because it's part of a workspace. Um, if it's published, you can generate a link to it. And so if you're ever wondering, like, why does, how does Kevin like get all those links in Discord? It's because if you ask me a question, I will usually know where it is on the website and then create a link to it. Um, and then also, if you ask, like, why did I not see that in the website? If there is a new question that is not in the website, I will add it, publish it, and then send you a link to it. So it's always on the website. Um, so that's lookup. And then the other way that I look through tasks is chronologically. It, it helps me anchor in time, like, oh, like what was that thing I did last week? Well, I can see it in my daily journal. I can navigate to it um, using sibling navigation. Um, but then did you lastly, pull that down with your mouse, or do you have a shortcut for that as well? Like a sh we, shortcut for what? For the clicking, did you click on you know Kevin Journal dot the date, so then you can see all the previous dates? Oh yeah, so this is just part of VS Code. So if you yeah. click on any part in the button, you can see. Everything no, no, else. you did that fast enough that I thought you might have had a shortcut. Like I've seen the, I can click on things, but I wasn't yeah. sure whether you did that or not. Okay. Yeah. Nope, no shortcut yet. Um, and then the other thing we can do is search. And so generally, like we talk about how like Indentrian for a lot of things you don't need to search, but search is still useful for um, that uh, Indentrian, the idea is we can enhance your search with hierarchy using uh, VS Code has this thing called the search editor. Um, and I have it to a keyboard shortcut. So my keyboard shortcut, what it does, uh, actually let's do it normally first. So the problem is I've forgotten how to do these things normally. Um, oh, yeah. So once you do your search, you can open it in the editor. So for example, I'm looking for jobs across all my workspaces. But then what I can do is like, hey, I only want to look in the journal hierarchy. And so this is, hey, this will limit this search to just daily.journal. Um, you can actually bind these editor searches to a keyboard shortcut. So what I have is, I'm in my daily journal. Um, I have a keyboard shortcut to look for everything in the current file. Um, and so this is like a great way of shutting a search within a hierarchy. And so say like, let's say I want to look at every time I mentioned job in the current month, then here's that search for everything in, uh, in the current month. And then, or if I wanted to, you know, let's say I'm looking at documentation, um, I can look up package to see like all the gotchas across all the documentation and dungeon. Um, so this is regular search, but it's made a lot more useful because, you know, or notes are well structured. So you can limit your search to just the section that you're looking for. Um, and something else you can do with search editors is you can actually save them. So this search editor, like let's say that I'm looking up stuff in packages a lot. I can save this, let's say as code.code search. And next time, uh, I can just open this and start my search like this. So you can save you know, your most commonly used searches to pull them up quickly. Um, Wait, how do, you, how do you open it back up? Oh, so what I do, because Dendron, like lookup only works over like the files in, uh, in Markdown, um, I use the regular command P, which you can use to open any file in your workspace. Oh, so it and saves so, it as a file. Yes, it saves it as a file. This is a special file type that VS yep. Code recognizes. Yep. The extension is code dash search. Very cool. Yeah. Can the cool thing about this is you can show the context. So, like, you know, this is really useful for, let's say that. Um, you want to see everything that has a particular tag. Like here's all the things that were tagged with new, then you can actually limit it to just that. Um, and Jonathan, you were asking a question, sorry. Where was that? Oh, can you later uh, share the shortcut? Because you yes. have to 
have some command to get like the current you know, context, right? Correct. Yes. So everything that I showed today, I'm just going to share my keyboard, key binding side JSON. It has shortcuts for all the things that uh, were shown today. Um, this is the shortcut for the uh, search editor. And yeah, I'll post them so you don't have to copy it down right now. Um, cool. I think uh, that's the main stuff. Um, so at this point, I will open it up to more questions if people have any. Another question? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I don't really know. I, I mean, I guess I haven't fully looked at the documentation. I don't really know. I never use the extra top row buttons and lookup. Oh, yes. Can you kind of explain yes. how you use those? Especially like things like multi select, I'm not, it's not very yep. clear. So I'd love to go over the top buttons. I think this is the most undiscoverable feature that we have. And that's saying something because a lot of our features are pretty hard to find. Um, so the various modifiers, they do, uh, so they have different effects. So one thing I like to do, for example, at the end of the day is I like to go over all the meetings that I've gone through in the day. And so for multi-select, you can select multiple nodes at once and it'll open all of them. And so usually what I'll do is I'll take this, for example, um, and I will copy it into my daily journal under events, and then I'll leave comments about that event underneath. Um, so. The initial one is multi-select. Um, the second one is to copy whatever is selected. So this copies, um, sorry, this doesn't copy the selection. This copies uh, the result. So if you wanted to just copy a particular note, uh, you can do that. And it'll copy that note as a link. And this is useful if you want to combine it with multi-select. For example, you wanted to Let's say I wanted to copy all my journal notes for this week. I can do a multi-select on all of them, and I can copy it. And so this will copy all five links. Um, so moving forward, um, what this is, it's a direct child filter. So something that you notice is this can be a little overwhelming um, if you look under package, because we complete, we show you everything. If you wanted to just to see the children, this limits the results to just the direct children instead of everything. Um, so it's useful for when you're trying to like discover something or if you try to see all of something at a certain level. Um, the next one, so the next two are what we call selection modifiers. So the first one is on by default and it's the extraction. Um, it's to extract the current selection. So what that means is you know, say this is a greenhouse talk. If I highlight it and I make this into a new note, because the extraction modifier is on, it extracts the text and puts it in the new note. Now, um, note two, the other modifier that we have is a selection to link modifier. Uh, this is, we pre select this by default when you do a scratch note. And what this does is instead of extracting the content, it turns the content into a link. Um, so let's just delete that. Um, and then moving forward, uh, the next two are modifiers for this is whatever hierarchy you're on, turn it into a journal. Um, and this is whatever hierarchy you're on, turn it into a sketch note. The exact formatting of this depends on how you configured it. And then the last one is normally we open up the node in the same window. That one will open it up in the window to the side. Um, the cool thing about all these modifiers is that they are configurable. So you can create custom keyboard shortcuts that say bring up lookup for a journal node with selection to extract and open it in a split pane or you know, do a lookup to copy whatever link I selected. Um, so the example that I showed earlier, where I have a note and I use a keyboard shortcut to immediately create a scratch note out of that, that's a custom shortcut that I have, which because as part of the uh, arguments for lookup, 
you can tell lookup to execute immediately based off the first option instead of popping you. So we have a non-interactive option. Does that make sense? And Jonathan, you're muted in case you're responding. Yeah, that's very cool. I did not know how to use or the use case of multi-select or the copy link or combining those two is pretty pretty awesome. Yeah, um, no, we have a lot of new things. We just don't do a very good job at explaining them right now, hence the screenhouse talk. Yeah, one little piece of feedback. I think I think the the toggling of the button state to check mark is a little confusing. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we could like bold the icon or something like that. I know what our options are because sometimes yeah. if you have a lot of things checked, then I lose context of what. Like if you if you're if you don't know exactly which button position is what, I have to like uncheck it to. Yep. Um, what that slot is doing. I totally agree. Uh, the check mark is not because it's the best UX, but it's because with uh, my limited design skills, <laughs> uh, that's what I had. So what you can do when you click a button is you can change the button image. Right, right, right. And so for me, these are all like stock icons in VS Code, and right. they don't have like a make it bolder. So I just turned it into a check mark. Um, but yes, making this bolder or highlighting it in some way would be a better UX. Another UX I was thinking about is having like a side view here that shows you like the current lookup modifiers that you have on with like an explanation and tooltip of what each one of them does. And so you can, for example, toggle maybe like, you know, for this session, I want to toggle on the copy um, modifier. And whenever you do lookup, then that's what comes up. Cool. Um, any more questions? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how you structure the vaults. So I've seen you reference uh, like what it seems to be a note on your personal note in your dendron workspace. And if they're separate workspace, how did that work? Or are they actually merged or together somehow? Yeah, so uh, right now, this is a feature we need to add. It's so a workspace file. So right now at, at Dendron, uh, if you're working at Dendron, what, you'll, uh, what you get to check out is you get to check out our workspace file. And it'll look a little different for you um, in the sense that these vaults don't exist. Um, so you get the rest of this. And then when you check out this workspace file, um, this, these vaults will clone automatically. Um, I've manually added some custom vaults to mine just because I use them a lot. Um, but the way that I manage this is I just don't commit them. And then when I make an update to dungeon.yaml, I will stash my changes, make the update, push it, and then pop my changes back in. It's not an ideal workflow. And in the future, we want to support, for example, this idea of like a local dungeon.yaml. So that when Dendron starts up, you might have a shared Dendron.yaml for you know, all the vaults that the team uses, but then it'll look into your local for additional vaults that are only local for your computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but right now what I do is I just manually add it. And I just don't, uh, and I'll just stash it if I need to change the YAML for the team. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you have like a local path, not the, it's not like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions? I guess one thing to point out: um, we're using seeds for the dungeon handbook and the dungeon site. Um, so seeds are a new feature that we're currently still working on, where it's this idea that you can publish your vault as a seed to the Dungeon Registry, and then other people can pull it down. So right now, it's only available via the CLI, but any of you can pull it down too. What's cool about the seed is you can attach a URL to it. So I apologize for the fire truck in the background. We're just very excited about seeds. Um, 
so for the handbook, if I wanted to generate, if I was in the handbook vault, I can generate a URL to handbook. But if I am in the dungeon vault, um, I generate a link to the dungeon wiki. And so uh, one of the benefits of having your vault as a seed is if you publish it, not only do you have local access, you also can share it really quickly with somebody uh, remotely, maybe even faster than the fire truck that is going out of outside right now. All right, and that's my plug for seeds, which we'll be working a lot on this coming month. Um, okay, well, if there's no further questions, um, the, everything here will be on YouTube and I also attach addendums in terms of key bindings, shortcuts and features that were talked about. Um, so thanks everyone for coming to this greenhouse talk and hope it's been helpful. <laughs>